this book is uh, now now considered the authoritative volume on uh, student re retention, particularly student retention of, of um, universities and colleges like like ours. Um, and it describes the uh, uh, collective activities, the collective <coughs> struggles that universities like uh, like ours um, go through to try to address um, uh, student, student retention. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Vincent Tinta. Thank you. Thanks for the, uh, can you all hear me? I, I grew up in New York City, you can tell from our British accent. <laughs> but see, we had communication. I grew up in uh, an immigrant community. My father's an immigrant. I'm a child of an immigrant. And uh, we, we lived in tenements. And we used, you know, the, the sort of uh, internet communication we had was yelling across buildings. It was <laughs> so I've developed a louder voice. So if you have trouble, can you hear me back there? Can you? Good. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I must confess, it's, um, it's a, it's, I've heard it before because I wrote a lot of that. That's why it's so objective. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it's actually a, a really nice introduction. It's nicer than one I had now about, let me think, seven years ago, my, my youngest daughter, Gabrielle, um, was finishing uh, the public high school in Syracuse. All our children went to public schools. Uh, and she was in her last year, and they had what's called career days. You know what those things are like? So all those students come into the auditorium, and they march out on the stage, people who represent different careers, and they bore them for an hour. Well, I, my chance, I was asked to bore them a little bit also, um, because I was on an NPR the week before. So I was asked to speak about what it's like to be a university professor. I mean, but in any case, they also had the legal counsel for the mayor. She was invited because it was a big political issue in town. She wanted to talk about being a lawyer in the public sphere. And because of a big political issue in town, they had the local television stations, ABC, NBC, CBS, and the public broadcasting station, all the cameras there with the reporters, because they wanted to listen to her. Well, because I taught at the university, about half a mile away, in the morning, they asked me to go first. Uh, and, and in the tradition of the school, they would have the young people in the classes introduce their speakers. So uh, because my, Gabby, my daughter Gabrielle, was a, in school, they asked one of her classmates, Timothy, to introduce me. Now, Timothy comes to me before the session and goes, there's cameras here. I've never done this before. What should I do? I'm nervous. How should I go about introducing you? This is, I could be on television, he said. I said, Timothy, really, it's really very simple. The rule of thumb is the less said, the better. Oh, all right. So he goes off. Well, the auditorium fills up, and he comes to the uh, podium. Thank you, sir. He comes to the podium, and he goes, uh, he goes, <laughs> New York. He says, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Principal Smith, members of the press. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Vincent Tinto, the father of my classmate, Gabrielle, for whom I've been told to tell you the less said, the better. <laughs> There's a lot to that, folks. There's a lot to that. So my daughter, Gabby, comes to me after and says, Dad, it's so embarrassing. I said, Gabby, what's the point of being a father if I can't embarrass my children? It's no, <laughs> there's no point. That yeah, was a true story. Anyway, the, the thing that explains physics to sociology is I went to the Peace Corps. I dropped out. I was a dropout. I was, I'm a 60s child. I was all about the 60s protest. And I left physics because I was so disconnected from the real world that I felt I, the only choice was to leave in order to drop in. So I, you know, my interest in this is partly autobiographical. But the issue has nothing to do with student retention, folks. I don't use that word. I don't use the R word. Because if you want to know the simple secret of institutional success is they don't ask the question, how do we keep our students or retain them? How do we help them learn and grow and succeed while they're here? It's an educational question. That's the source of our concern. And retention is this byproduct. So don't ask the question, how do I keep our students? I don't want to hear that question. I want you to ask how we together, you together, construct settings in which students will find value, learn, and succeed. That's the question. It's an educational question. It's not a retention question. And I, you know, I'm a faculty member. I've heard my faculty say, look, if they only gave me better students, I wouldn't have a retention problem. <laughs> what? 
Okay. Thanks for letting me come on this uh, sunny day, uh, cool but sunny day. I must confess, if I, if I fall asleep during my presentation, realize that I watched the Syracuse Connecticut basketball game last <laughs> night. <laughs> and I, I said, <laughs> <laughs> That, you know, I'm a college, I love lacrosse in particular. I think lacrosse is a great game. But, you know, I love college sports because kids are really excited. They, they're not being paid $40 million to, you know, a year. At least, at least I don't know about that. <laughs> so I was up to 1.30. And, okay. So wake me up when we're finished and I'll be fine. Uh, let me say, uh, it, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. You know, I, I think uh, Ed said that I work with a lot of TRIO programs. I do work with Opportunity. And I know you, demographics of your students. You have a large proportion of Pell eligible students, about 75%. Uh, most of them are first in their family to go to college, they're first generation college students. And the fact is, though everybody writes about Harvard and Princeton and Yale, it what happens here that really is the future of our country. Because for those students, this is an opportunity that most students don't have. If you can't translate access into real opportunity, we failed an important mission for ourselves as a, members of a society. So for me, it, I'm, I'm proud to be asked, and I'm flattered to be asked to help you think about how we can transform access to real opportunity for success for our students, for whom it's the first opportunity they had to go to college. Uh, but in doing so, let me be clear, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I've read a lot of your documents. I've had conversations with your colleagues before he, uh, I came, actually. Uh, and I know a, a bit about your institution. Uh, but it's not my job to come and tell you what to do. That's not my job. But I will try to share with you the experience I've had over 30 years now, when I started when I was 15, <laughs> learning from people who are quite talented, faculty members, student affairs professionals all across the country who've actually done things successfully. And my job is to share with them, with you, what they would say were they here. So I'm gonna to try to give you some examples of programs that work, how they work, what they're doing, and it's for you to decide. Not for me. I mean, it's not my job. So I really want to engage in a conversation. And therefore, though my time is limited because I have to get a flight back to California this afternoon, this evening, I want you to take my email address down. Because if you have questions, you want to, you know, raise issues, email me. I have a Mac. It works. Uh, no, seriously, folks. I mean, I, I think it's part of being in a conversation with me. And I'll give you the names of other people for whom you should talk. Because you have to be engaged in a conversation with other people who are already doing these things. And that's who you should be talking to. And my job is to facilitate that shared conversation, okay? So please, don't be reluctant to email me or call me up, okay? Okay, so I want to share with you, in effect, what I've learned from other people. And, and the first thing I've learned, uh, and it, this is, we function in the outline, um, I want to first talk about how people think, how they think about what they're trying to achieve. Uh, and talk about wh what I would say is the way they think about constructing environments or conditions in which they place students. Uh, and then move to talk about what they literally are doing, given how they think, what they're literally doing to translate what they think about into real forms of action. It's the same way I've started by talking about it. it's not retention. You don't think about that. You think about educating your students. And then I want to talk about, in closing, why it, really, it is really true in some important way that we quote, student success is everyone's business. Though it's all our business, it is a shared business, if you will. Okay, so. To talk about, so, so is that okay with you? Say yes. Yes, you have no <laughs> choice, but you know, say yes anyway. Okay. To, to talk about the first thing, you know, th there is a, a growing movement captured by the work of Barr and Tag. Um, it's called, you know, uh, Tag just wrote a book called The Learning College. That's really a couple of years old now. But they were capturing a movement, a phenom phenomenon. And, and the shift it sounds subtle, but actually quite significant. Because the instructional paradigm, they, they argue, is, is, uh, is governed by a, a specific question. And that question is, how do we teach our students? And they argue, if you think about it, that instructional question, how do we teach our students, centers the discourse about this issue around the faculty person. 
who teach students and, and implies a sort of a, a hierarchical relationship between the teaching and the learning and sort of a, a notion of filling up the vessel, you know? So we as faculty distribute the gems of knowledge gently in the classroom to the attentive eyes of our students who sit in rapt attention. <laughs> Just like my class, right? And, and your class, right? Um, and it sort of puts the students at the margins in a subs subservient position, if you will. Uh, now, it, it, it's, it's obviously more complex than that. Uh, they say instead to teach and educate today's students, not yesterday's students, uh, we have to move from that to a learning paradigm, which asks a different question. That is, how do we help our students learn? Now, the question seems, you know, how different is that? But in fact, it's quite different if you, you, you know, extend it. Because the learning question situates the students at the center of the discourse and, and recognizes everything she or he brings to the table. That just getting here is a remarkable success for a lot of our students. They bring a lot of skills. They have talents. Though we don't often don't see it that way. Because getting here is not a trivial achievement. And then says, their learning is shaped by a variety of environments or settings in which we place them, not just our teaching. It's shaped by the expectational climate, by the reward system, you name it, a whole set of environments. So they see learning as a more complex outcome, a whole set of interaction between various settings in which we place students. And then ask, in that setting, what's our role as faculty and student affairs? And what people are saying is that we have to, therefore, not ask just how we teach students, but how we construct the environments in which we place students that we know promote the success in which they seek to learn and in which we seek to teach and work. That's the way they think. Now, of course, there are many things that affect student success. Uh, you know, personal lives, external conditions. I mean, your students who live in residence go home every weekend. They take their laundry, go out, and they, they leave. So there's many things that affect their lives. And not all those things we can do anything about reasonably, though we'd love to. I mean, certainly student professionals, you know, the, 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 you know, who always want to rescue everybody. The fact is we don't have that control, even though we'd like to. So the reasonable way to ask, to start this conversation, is to ask the question, given those things over which we already have some control, <coughs> what is it we can do to help them learn? Right? So the question is, what do we know about those environments over which we already have control within the campus that we can change? Because those environments, those conditions, we've already constructed. We've decided what they're like from past decisions, past regulations. And if we're serious, we can change those environments. We could, because we have control of them. Or at least we think we do. So that's the way they think. So you, you can ask, start the conversation by saying, well, what is it we know then from research and from practice about those conditions or environments in which we place students and ask them to, to learn and succeed that promotes their success. Because if we know what those conditions are, we can say to ourselves, then how do we build it on our campus? Okay? So that's what I want to do. I want to first review what we know from research on those conditions. And I'll, I try to simplify it by talking about four. There's not basically four or five, but four major conditions. So let's, let's look at that. What, what do we know about those conditions that affect student success? First, expectations matter. The surprise, surprise. Now, most of your students are first generation college students. They don't have what's called the cultural capital, you know, the, the sociological critical theory, you know, you know. They don't really have the shared knowledge that many of us have had who are college. How many of you are first generation college students, by the way, here? I certainly am. My, my father had one year of school and my mother was raised in a convent. So I, I appreciate how much it was a struggle to figure out what I was going to do. So students come and they really don't know. And that's why this issue of making clear, especially in the first year, what's required and what's expected of them, both for the university, for programs, and for classes, is so important success. They simply need to know the rules of the game. Now we can call that advising, but it's more. But those clarity, consistency, and availability of expectations, where actions conform to words are an important part of any success. Because if you don't know where you're going, it's hard to get there. That's a quote from Yogi Berra, the famous New York philosopher, 
<laughs> of course, he traveled in the subways of New York City like I did, and it's a real true. If you don't know where you're going, you don't get there. Even if you know where you're going, it's hard to get there. But just as important, an environment of high expectations drives student success. Look, folks, no one rises to low expectations. Yet, you want to know a dirty little secret that we talk about privately, or we at least be willing to talk about privately? Universities often don't expect enough of their students, or at least some. A recent, you know, you use the Nessie data, National Service Student Engagement, and I know George Koo for many years, and Alex McCormick, the new director. Well, George published a piece of research about four years ago that summarized the, expectational, the expectations of students when they enter and when they leave the first year, the first year expectations. And he discovered that on average, students who enter a four-year university, on average, across this country, typically expect to spend less than half the time studying than faculty would claim they have to study to succeed. They expect less than we would like them to have them expect. But damning is the information that over the course of the first year, their expectations for the amount of work they have to do declines. Get that? Declines. Well, you say to yourself, how is that possible? How is it possible that we, I mean we, generically, we say we expect this, they come in expecting less, and when they finish the first year, they expect even less. Well, something has taught them what to expect. So my point is, uh, if that's the case, you're not helping students succeed. Certainly some of them who need expectations. No one rises to low expectations. And that's not, it's hard to figure out a, a quote, a success strategy. But it means that we have to be clear that we hold excellence as a standard for all students, not just some and ask how do our actions reinforce those expectations in practice. And you know, students, you know, I, I know this because I, I had the experience, they pick it up pretty quickly. I was a low income kid, you know, go to college and they look at me and say, mm. and they ask different questions of you. Oh, of course this happens to students of color, more often than not. And students are very quick, you know, do they, really, they really think I can do well here? They really think I belong? Am I, you know, should they have admitted other people, not just me? It's very important. And students, when they get that impression, that affects the ability to succeed, even desire to succeed here or there. So expectations matter. And students pick it up. It's very subtle. I mean, it's all things, classroom behaviors, how faculty talk to people, how people raise hands and what they say. And you have to look behind the behaviors. You know, the students have this 18-year-old behavior. They, they're cool. I don't care. You know, I don't care. It's not true. Okay. Expectations matter. An environment rich in clear, high, consistent expectations <coughs> is a condition on which it is possible to succeed. But success without support isn't possible. So and the other environment which is necessary given expectations is important support. Right? You know that. We have a whole range of academic support programs, social support programs, financial support programs that we have. And that's nothing new to you. But what's increasingly clear is that the type of support that matters most is support that's connected to the classroom, or we call contextualized support. That is to say, the closer your support can be connected to the daily learning needs of students in the classroom, the more likely that support is to be able to use by students to succeed in the classroom. Why? Look, most of your students commute. Many of them work. Some go part-time. They have other obligations. Most students, certainly in a community college, but even here I wager, when they come to class, when they come to campus, the first place they could go if they're not going to go to the coffee or talk to their friends is the classroom. And when the class is over, many of them go where? Or to another campus. Right. So if they're not finding support in the classroom to learn, they don't get support. And for many of them who work, when we think of the first year experience, you know, academics do this, the first year experience. We actually have people consult on the first year experience. It turns out many low-income students don't think about success that way. 
They think success is one course at a time. And for them, success is constructed by succeeding in this class this week, doing the assignments for next week, and going on. So your support activities have to be geared to address that process by connecting support to helping them succeed in the class, one class at a time. And that's only possible when support and people, academic affairs, student affairs, or learning center people, work with faculty to in some way embed or connect support to the classroom. And the other reason that's the case is, of course, you know, we give learning centers, we have tutorial sessions, and often students have difficulty understanding how to translate that to the practical problem of succeeding in the classroom. So I'm going to talk about those strategies. One of them that I think you know about is called supplemental instruction. How do we organize the linking of support activities to the experience of the classroom in some reasonable way? And that involves collaboration between faculty and other people. Okay. So support matters, but it matters when it's connected to the daily learning needs of students in the places they're seeking to learn, the classroom in particular. Okay. Support. Feedback matters. An environment rich in the assessment of student performance that is fed back to students, faculty, and staff so everyone can adjust their behaviors to help students learn. It's not just assessment, it's the use of assessment data that produces a feedback loop between the faculty, the institution, and the students. So everyone learns about what students are doing in order to help the students do better. Now, there's several ways that's being done. I mean, th there is, of course, we all admit and have entry assessment. And the point of entry assessment, you'd like to think, is that it provides students, uh, you, the capacity to say, you need to do this. Or, if you could, allocate students to certain learning situations or classrooms so that they're not misplaced, right? Because one of the complex, you know, how many people are faculty here? Oh, good. I'm putting in a raise for all of you, by the way. <laughs> right. Um, no, no. Because you know when you're teaching a class, if the learning range of skills is so wide, it's very, very hard to do, construct a meaningful pedagogy. And so the point of entry assessment is to try to minimize, where possible, that range in the classroom. So we as faculty are engaged students who have more reasonable range that we can deal with. Right? And uh, having that wide range, undermines a lot of pedagogy. It's, it's, it's a problem. But just as important is use of assessment and, and feedback for monitoring and early warning. Do you have an early warning system here? Yeah. Okay. Who wants to describe to me what it's like? What is it like? Can someone stand up and volunteer? Thank you. Yeah, I love volunteers. Okay. <laughs> Please stand up. Your name? Roger Noah Griffin. Good. Hi. Hi. You have uh, a Starbucks there, don't you? Yes. Oh, I need a Starbucks, man. Uh, I stayed up too late. Okay, so uh, we have our early alert system is tied into Banner, our student information. Ah, uh, Banner. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that. I bite my tongue. <laughs> I hear no evil. I say no evil. I speak. They sign in. They're all. they all their courses pop up. They click the class. The list of students come up, and they click that. Who's they? The faculty person. Good. And then they can indicate what the issue is in terms of early alert. Missed classes. Missed Good. assignments. Good. And typically, when does that occur in the semester? Uh, the first 10 weeks of the semester. First 10 weeks. It, yeah. And then what happens? Let's say, typically, on average, when does that typically occur? The fifth week, sixth week, seventh week? Somewhere between the third week and mm. the seventh week. Is okay. We get the most and work. then what happens next? And then that information go, comes to our, my office, the Center for Academic Support. Yeah. And um, my early alert coordinator will contact the student. The student Good. can either provide feedback, the faculty can provide feedback. They can click on, Good. all Good. parties can click on and see the status of it. Good. Okay. So Good. That's either good. Okay. Referred to support or. Uh, let's see. How should you do this and get a candid response? Mm -hmm. How many faculty actually use that system in their first year <laughs> classrooms? Uh, okay. We well, actually have 1,100 early alert Do you? Whoa. And you have an entering class of about 1,200, 1,300? Yeah. But it's 
Well, do you emphasize the first year in particular? Uh, it's, it's, yes, the, fir the first two years. Okay, good. Really uh, uh, let me, uh, g on your handout, I want you to write down this uh, theoretically complex notion. It's going to take a couple of sentences, okay? The secret of an effective early warning system, you writing this down? No, I observe better this way. Okay. The secret of effective early warning system is that it's early. This is why you came this today to be bored. I mean, this is, no, I mean, it's very important you understand this. I mean, early. And you're, you're good, but it could be even earlier. Because research shows in the first year in particular, because, you know, you, your attrition is typical of a lot of four-year schools. Over half your students will leave, leave before the start of the second year. You have uh, roughly 54% of students who leave. Who, of the students who leave, roughly 54% leave before the start of the second year. And that's why so much emphasis is on the first year experience because you can, you can address that and minimize other problems later on. So in any case, so early warning systems occur. But research in the first year and the first semester, first courses show, especially for first generation college students, and in particular those who struggle academically in the past, when they come into class and they start struggling again the first week, I don't understand what's going on here, they get discouraged a little bit. And it, if it mounts the second week and third week, they get really discouraged. And if you wait too long, it's already too late for many of them. So the point is, the sooner the better, the earlier the better. And it has to be very proactive. You don't just send out an email and help. This faculty member says, listen, I, I see you're having a struggle. I'm, I'm, you know, I want someone to contact you. Is something going on? So the faculty member working with your staff has to really be proactive early. Because if you let it confusion mount, they get discouraged and they say, oh, here we go again. Right? And that's what you want to avoid, because they start expecting less of themselves. It's self-efficacy that's involved here. So early warning should be early. This is theoretically complex. That's why I write a book. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, academics, we, we have this way of, you know, we speak at meetings, we use professional language, and we talk deeper at professional meetings. <laughs> My multivariate regression equation using literal error technique, technique shows that with a 55% confidence interval, I think it applies that this may be the case that <laughs> early warning should be early. Okay. <laughs> oh man, okay. But just as important is the assessment of learning in a classroom. And I'll, I'll talk about examples of that. You, faculty need to also construct their own early warning system within classes. And I'll talk about one minute papers. How many people know about one minute paper? Good, I'll talk about that in a minute. So, feedback is a condition. But it's the use of feedback information that matters, not the collection of feedback information. It's use. So people can adjust their behavior. Students, faculty, and staff adjust. Okay. And of course, involvement or engagement, the primary condition everyone talks about now. That's why Nessie is this survey of student engagement. The fact is, the more frequently students report valued contact, not just contact, but valued contact, with other students, faculty, and staff, other things being equal, the more likely they will persist and succeed. Being a member of a valued educational community drives success. A community that has high expectations, provides support and feedback, drives success. And where is involvement most important? In the classroom. Active involvement, active, not passive, active, how do you have passive involvement? Active involvement, especially with other students, in the classroom is a key form of involvement because that drives this critical thing called time on task. Here's another complex theoretical conclusion. One of the strongest predictors of how much students learn over time is it directly a function of how much time they spend studying? Hmm, interesting conclusion, isn't it? The question is, that's also called intensity of effort, it's called. How do you get students to spend time on task? You see? That's where involvement matters. Research has shown us that even among students who persist and complete a program or degree, 
those who persist who have more active engagement with others in learning activities show greater learning gain in persisting. And that's our goal. It's not retention. Okay? So it is this form of engagement in particular that drives this, that drives learning. Those are the conditions. And if you had to summarize it, I'm going to repeat. You try to see your work as in various ways constructing those set of conditions that provide clear and high expectations to students, provide support that is connected to their learning needs, that allows for assessment and feedback information so we can adjust our behaviors and actively engage our students with other students and ourselves in learning. For all students, not just some. Learning that's valued and relevant to student needs. That's what we're trying to do. And that's what everyone's trying to do. Okay? <laughs> I can hear my daughter saying, Dad, don't embarrass me, please. <laughs> so before I go on, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, but before you do that, turn to your neighbor, saying, God, this guy is brilliant, isn't he? <laughs> Um, I need more sleep. I really do. Uh, uh, is there anything I want to, is anything that's unclear to me? Any, anything I want to ask? So just turn to your neighbors and do that. And I'll just take a minute and a minute and a half, and then I'll ask for questions to talk about this before we go on, okay? So these are the environments. That's what it's called moving from teaching to learning. That's what we're about. So do that for a minute. Turn to your neighbors. And well, I get a drink of agua. <laughs> Brilliant. So, who would like to start with a question or a comment? Madam? Stand up so everyone can hear you, please. And your name? Hi, I'm Patricia Whiteman. I work in Residence Life. And with my neighbors on both sides, we just had a discussion about applying this to our student body. And we all know that, you know, there are particular barriers for some of our students that come here in terms of their learning styles, in terms of their cultural background. And you mentioned expectations. And the expectations... Oh, oh, I'm, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why okay. do you... I mean, I, I want to make clear that when you say there's cultural barriers to learning, um, I'll, I'll make a comment there. I mean, I think... Yeah, that's no, I, I said cultural barriers to their success. Oh, okay. Because... And what are they? In some, in some ways, the expectations that some of these students, and, and maybe generational and not cultural, and that's one of the things we just discussed, is they have low expectations placed on them in high school. And then when they come here, they tend to think maybe it's the same of what they had. Do you have evidence for that? Oh, yes. Do I have evidence for that? I, I think in, in residence life, I'm not a faculty person, but in residence life, yes. Okay. We see some of that. Yeah, um, I do think that some students come thinking that they can succeed without applying themselves. We talk about time on task. Well, that's a different issue. I mean, that, that is, they, they, they may expect to succeed, but they think success requires maybe less than you want. Correct. Right, okay. And that's the fault of, uh, I mean, I've seen students come in with a straight A in high school, and they discover they're, they're remedial students. <laughs> yes. And that's, that's the issue that high schools have constructed. Right. People get by getting grades that they really don't deserve. High schools want to get rid of them, and they come to college and you bear the consequence. People say, hey, why am I in basic skills? I got a straight A average in high school. Because you don't know the material. <laughs> but I mean, I, I want to make sure that when we talk about this issue, you separate out various things that seem to be included in a broad statement. Because they, they are very subtle differences and important differences. I, I, am, I am being broad. I will, okay. I will admit that. But I, I do want to see, my question to you is, will you break that down for us other institutions um, because of the types of students that we do have here? Thank you very much. That's a good question. Uh, the answer is you're not unique. No, you're not. I mean, look, I, I know we all feel we're different. I'm special. Um, no, I don't, you know, I don't mean to, as, a, as a criticism, but the fact is I, I've been around the block more than once. This is not an untypical situation. This is actually a, a national tragedy we're dealing with in terms of what high schools have allowed to let happen. 
and what we try to do in higher education. Um, students come believing that a certain amounts of work is sufficient when it's not. Uh, they often come in legacy struggle where they get certain messages in society that say some people should succeed and some are less likely to. And those are complex issues. Uh, my concern is given what they do when they come here, how do you address that? So that's why I say for expectations, why it's very important, very at the outset, in your marketing material, in your advertising material, in your admission material, it's very clear that you come here, this is what we expect, and it must be reinforced by action. And that means you have tough love. I mean, there's no question. And some students are going to struggle to make that adjustment. And then you ask, then what support do they need to make the adjustments with your help? Because you're not going to address the high schools. It's, it's going to take a while. Yeah, it's only taken 60 years and nothing's happened. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it, let's be realistic. You can't solve all those problems. The question is then, what do we do about it? Now, for example, people tell me, oh, students are not engaged. Not true. They Twitter, they Facebook, they text <laughs> message. They're engaged, not in what we want them to do. People say students are not interested in learning. Not true. They're learning all the time, everything. Facebook, you know, what's going on on Oprah, you know. <laughs> this is not learning what we want them to learn. So how do we take their natural interest in being engaged, 18-year-olds, being social, and wanting to learn, how do we translate that into learning that matters as we understand it for their success? That's our task. No, I don't mean to be critical. I, mean, I think it's just um, the students you have are not unique. That's the students we must address as a society. That's why I said I'm flattered you asked me to come and talk about that issue, because this is the issue that really matters. It's not the students at Harvard. They're going to see because they're well-to-do, they're privileged, and they'll do better without the faculty. <laughs> no, really. No, I mean, uh, I won't go there. Okay. So please, I, th I think then the question is what empirical evidence you have about students and their experiences that says, given what they're now experiencing on campus, how do we alter that if, if necessary? So this is an empirical question. That's why I ask you what evidence you had. Because a lot of the stuff we talk about on campuses is based upon our own personal experience. And that's not empirical evidence. I mean, in any uh, generalizable way. So there's a real need to get assessment data. And I looked at your Nessie surveys and, you know, there's stuff to learn. Residence life is another problem, however, and I don't, I mean, maybe studies, students study too much in residence life. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> um, okay, and another question or an issue? Yes, please. Uh, Your name, please? Dr. Young, Sandra Young. I'm Dean of Science and Health. And nursing program. I am a nurse. Yeah. Um, we have, we think we set high ex clear high expectations in first year seminar, for example. Students in my first year seminars have often told me they never had any homework in high school. They never had to study whatever. So we tell them, you know, what we expect, how much, how hard they're going to have to work to get uh, successful here. Then we look at our senior surveys that tell us that students, especially in the general education courses, said they never had to work hard anyway. So we told them they had to, but they didn't. So we're not reinforcing our expectations. Everybody hear that? Do you want me to say anything about that? Why is that the case? You have to answer that question. Why is it the case seniors will say they didn't have to do much work in general education? That's a question you must ask and answer. My name is Isabel Tirado. I'll speak louder, please. Isabel? I'm Isabel, and I'm Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences and I was also a faculty member back like Sandy. And I've al also taught uh, not only the GE uh, major courses, but also freshman seminar. And what really strikes me is that it doesn't matter what class I teach, they always tell me the same thing. You're the hardest teacher you've, uh, we've ever had. You give us the most work, Good. nobody else gives. And I really, at first I believed it, <laughs> but I really don't think that, I think there's a lot of negotiation that goes on. Uh, you know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, we are over students, we try to negotiate our uh, demands, right? And if we see inconsistent expectations across classes, we try to negotiate those that are outliers expecting more down. And therefore, there is an issue how 
how consistent we are across, let's say, the first year curriculum, that students encounter a common set of expectations with work requirements. So they're not in a situation where they can negotiate one faculty against another, right? So they all should encounter classes that are demanding, that expect excellence of them. So that's another issue. Why is it expectations vary, perhaps? Perhaps, I don't know if they do. Why is it faculty demands for effort may vary between courses? I don't know if they do, but if they do, why? Because students, well, you know, we all do that. We negotiate, we, you know. Because they're busy, they like to have less work than more. But effort leads to learning, learning leads to success. Bingo. Okay. Let me move on. I mean, they, this is, these are complex issues. I don't mean to uh, critique. It's not that. It's just that at some point you have to ask yourself hard questions. Is it the case? Why is it the case? And then what do we do about it? We all, we're all on the same boat, folks. We're not different. We just have certain different students, but it's the same issue. Okay. So what then are universities across the country are doing? Well, they're doing many things. There's no one thing. I mean, there isn't as if there's a retention strategy. Oh, I'm all worried. Success strategy. There are a lot of things people are doing that require many people acting in various ways, in ways that they collaborate and make systematic. It is indeed a shared responsibility. So let me just go through some of them, and we'll talk about some more than others. Right. Intrusive advising, counseling, and mentoring. You have a lot of first-year college students. You have people who come in who don't quite have the same cultural capital as other students may have who are privileged. And there's really a critical question about the advising in the first year. What do they learn then that frames how they proceed through the first year? Now, I know your advising system. I've learned about it. Uh, and I, this reminds me of uh, my youngest daughter, Gabrielle. Uh, she, I, we were visiting a college, uh, I took her to all the college tours, I just left her alone, I just stayed, I dropped her off and left her off. And they had their parents, you know, ses sessions. And I remember one, one uh, dean of admission saying, you know, I want to tell you how much we care about students here. We sign every student an individual faculty advisor. <laughs> now I know what that means. <laughs> some students are lucky, and some are not. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the truth, folks. No, come on, let's be honest. It, it happens to all of us, you know. Some faculty know what they're doing, some don't. Some care about it, some do not. And if you're lucky, great. If you're not lucky, your experience is skewed. <laughs> it matters to have a consistent, intrusive, first-year advising programs where students are, where it's not left a chance, they find the right information. Now, you have degree order systems, right? So that helps, because at least that part of knowing what cost to take should be solved, even with Banner. <laughs> but that's why so many campuses who focus on the first year, as you should, take first year advising as a professional responsibility in some way. So that all first year students meet at least twice, if not three times the first year, a professional first year advisor who then works and layers on with the faculty advisors in programs. So there's a shared sort of collaboration between professional advisors who advise first year students on basic advising questions, first year college, all you do, and then works with a faculty person who represents a program or a department. So you try to shift advising in the transition between the first year and a major. Now you have advising for undecided students, but it's more than that, you see. It's just that you can't leave first year advising to the whims of variation among faculty. Not that you don't care as faculty. Now, you're the choir. You're here. But it, it happens. It just, that's the way it works. So intrusive advising. In some cases, institutions are betting advising in things like the freshman seminar, which you have. But I'll talk more about that. Because you never have enough staff. You have 1,300 new students come in in the first year. Could you, could you afford to have enough trained professional advisors to deal with all 1,300? So what they're doing is bringing advisors, professional advisors, into first-year classrooms. And the seminar becomes a common place to do that. And it show, you, the, we, we learn that when advisors go to first-year classrooms, students in those classrooms are more likely to access the advisor than those situations where they're not. Because they see a real person. Someone nice. 
typically a, not a male, but you know, <laughs> I'm only, I'm the exception. <laughs> Aren't we all? Uh, so that you, you say, if we can't afford enough individualizers, you embed it in the curriculum of the first year. And s freshman seminars often help serve that purpose, but I would say not the only way to do that. And of course, for many first year advisors, students, certainly those who you categorize as EOF or sponsored, right? Or students who you may say, because of certain characteristics, may be uh, more at risk, you have targeted advising. And in many cases, peer, peer mentoring. Why? Because there's an important type of advising that we can't do as adults. Or a, an, a white person can't do for students of color. It's how do you navigate this white place? And who does that well? The students who already learned to navigate it themselves. More than the adults. Because you know, what they will do is say, look, I've walked this path. I'm in my fourth year. Let me tell you how to walk this path, too. So there's an investment in some targeted peer mentoring programs. But if you do that, you have to train those peer mentors. It's not something you leave to chance. Because like a, a secretary or residential staff person will learn, you learn things about students' struggles in their lives that are often really scary stuff. So those peer mentors are actually part of an early warning system. You use them, and they have to know who to call if they hear something going on. <coughs> So uh, various forms of advising, formal and informal advising, if you will. Do you have peer mentors? Can you tell me about it? Can you stand up, please? Your name? I'm uh, Kim Daniel Robinson, the director of first-year experience. The first-year seminar course comes out of the first-year experience department, and we do have peer leaders that actually co-teach. In, in, oh, good. They co-teach the first-year seminar course. They, there's a full training for them. They have two-day intensive oh, good. training from various departments. Good as well as counseling, health, and wellness. So and and when, you, when you have focus groups with those peer advisors, what do they tell you about what's going on? Yeah, they, they do. They tell us a lot about what's going on with the students, with that right. information issues. And that's part of your assessment system. And how do you use that information that they tell you about? Then, then we know how to develop programs and work more to help the So give me an example. What, how, what has, how have you used that information to, to establish a program or change something? Can you give me an example? Um, students would say things students who live in residence life, I think one of the big things is that they think nothing is going on. Oh, yeah, I agree. So they always say, nothing's going on. <laughs> Evening is dead, the weekends forget it, nothing's going on. So my office implemented some programming where we actually, we, we linked the first year seminar courses with an academic course with a group of students who live in residence facility. Because we're academic affairs, we get to bring in right. academic workshops into the residence right. facilities in the evening with the right. students. So they can have something to do, and they can talk intellectually about the common reader or... Intellectually. <laughs> you see the basketball game last night, man? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Of course, residential life is only about, what, 20% of your first year's class, right? So the question is, how do you move beyond... You get the Not same the principle. Year Not first year. First year. Or close to the, yeah, 50 in the first year? Good, okay, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Okay. Yes, please. We also peer mentor to the enrichment program while they're actually doing EOS? Uh, no. no. It's, it's for all science. Anybody oh. take a science course. That's right. And, and primary um, health enrichment is through science students that are taking courses. And what's your experience doing that? Um, what happens is students actually would prefer to talk to other students than any adult. Um, you know, people that are fully. Fully matured? <laughs> <laughs> well, fully matured. Okay. Um, forget it. Okay. That's interesting you say that. Yeah, and, and they'll tell them all sorts of things. Absolutely. And that's why they have to be part of an early warning system. You really have to be careful not to put these young people in situations they shouldn't be in. And you know this, of course. So you give them a backup system when they have phone numbers to call at night. Uh, they have to know what to do. So you use them. But they have to be trained. Yeah, good, good. Now, of course, there's a limit to what you can do because there's only student, so many student mentors you can get. So it's one strategy. You add to a variety of strategies. Good, good, good. Fully matured. I've never heard that before. <laughs> My daughter say her father's never fully matured. But that's another story. Okay. Support programs. Again, I made this point about connecting support. There's so many different ways of doing this. Um, you know... Uh, freshman seminars uh, are often used
to do that. I mean, it's sort of a, you know, the seminar comes from the orientation tradition. <coughs> and what is, is said, what it realized, people realized many years ago, uh, is that, you know, you have this orientation, you have orientation, students come in, right? Yep. And all the, the administrators and deans come out and say, we love you all, welcome to William Patterson, here's information, read it. The kids go, oh my God. <laughs> Not at our oh, no, not at yours. Of course not. <laughs> They're up till 2 in the morning playing volleyball. Oh, that's good, actually. That's good. Because the secret of good orientation is not content, it's activity. You know that. Good. Um, but then they'll say, folks, do you have any questions before the semester starts? No, because they don't even know what the questions are yet. <laughs> and that's why freshman seminars develop, because they realize the orientation has to be a longer process. That's, I mean, you know this already. Um, but increasing over time, seminars become differentiated. They serve different purposes. Some uh, serve learning skill needs, learning to learn, student success courses. So in some cases, you try to embed support in a classroom. And this freshman seminar becomes that place of embedding it. Unfortunately, the danger is if the seminar is not connected to other courses in some meaningful way, it marginalizes support as if it belongs to one course and nothing else. And in that way, what happens, um, the seminar serves inadvertently uh, as a vaccine. That is to say, uh, you know, if we can't address the first year, at least we can add a course that vaccinates, inoculates the students from the first year experience. <laughs> well, it, and it's, un, it's common. That, that's what happens because it's too hard to integrate all that. But when you do that, and students see this as a separate thing from the real curriculum, they discount the freshman seminar. I don't know if that's the case here, but the point is, uh, though it's often the place you begin to integrate support, that's not where you should end up. You're not, you shouldn't end up just there at the margins of the academic life. Okay? Well, so there's other forms of support. One of them is the supplemental instruction model. How many people know you have SI here? How many people use SI in their classrooms? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here is SI. Now you've probably seen this model before. <laughs> Typically, it's a form of support connected to an individual course. So here, it could be English. In your case, it's probably mathematics or whatever. Uh, students, either as a condition of being placed here, I mean, they're placed in an SI course because of the academic records, or because of early assessments in the first week they are required to come to a supplemental study group. But here is a class that has maybe, let's say the class is 40 or 80 or 40. You could have groups of 10. Now the trick here is the tutor, which could be a learning center person, but in many universities, a student who had an A before in the course. The tutor works with the instructor, with her or him, uh, either by sitting in the class or meeting with the instructor week to week so they know what are the assignments required in the class week to week or class to class? So the whole job of the study group is to help the students acquire the skills to do the assignments one class at a time. That's a very structured, you know, directed form of assess, uh, support that says you do this, students are more likely to succeed one class at a time. And the research shows that this model improves substantially the average GPA of a class by bringing up the bottom. Right? And it all works because there's a clear connection between what this person's doing to what the instructor needs. And it's this collaboration that makes it work. Wh who's using, who knows about, the, who's using this on the campus now? Yes, please. <laughs> Once again. Once again. Mm. For nursing and psychology. And Good. And what's the evidence on using it for elementary stat? Uh, well, we're doing it one section with a student that passed the class who's sitting in the class at the class Good. period. And they're doing three hours a week of, of okay. SI. Um, students, you, we, ha we have a core group of about maybe eight students that do it consistently, and then, of course, when there's yeah, a it, it, test coming up, yeah, we're that's right. It. Yeah, um, it, but we also have tutoring for, for those right. courses, too. 
And what's the what evidence? What's the evidence of the outcome of that supplemental uh, instruction? Last semester was the first semester we did that particular course. And every student that attended that side passed the course with the. Oh, who attended it? Day. Yeah. Good. Well, that's it. But first of all, you pointed out a problem: getting students to come. Right. That's why it has to be very clear what's expected, I mean, as if you can get everybody to come. But that's the evidence. And that's why they're being used in key gateway courses, the term used. Because you say to yourself, look, student success is constructed one course at a time, right? Which courses in the first year are most critical that must, students must get the material for them to succeed later on? And that's where you invest your, so you don't do it all courses, key courses. And some courses you do because some courses have high, high failure rates, right. stat. It's a very, yeah, please. Do most schools require students to do this if they're Well, you know, let me put, let me fra hear the question. Do most schools require? Uh, I, I am old-fashioned. Ask my daughters. Um, well, regardless of what I'm doing, old-fashioned, because I'm not their age. Um, if I have empirical evidence that something benefits student success, why wouldn't I require it? Student success does not arise by chance, you see? So if I have empirical evidence that benefits students, why wouldn't I require it? Now, requiring it and getting students to go is not the same thing. So if, to me, if you're going to stop this strategy, do so in a small way and get empirical evidence. Does it help student success? If it does, expand it to another course. If that keep working, <coughs> then you can say, should we require it? Now, of course, it means that there's additional hour of time. Some students may have trouble making it because of work obligations. So it, it isn't something you just slash and burn. Yes? We modify the program somewhat, so it's based on demand. Students demand that spot. They keep the spot as long as they want it. It's been extremely successful. Mm. We, we statistically found it helps, and we get groups that can range from five to... Hear that? Here's another important theoretical secret. If something works, do more of it. No, I'm serious, folks. I mean, there's often things on our own campus that are working that we don't know about, so we're not learning from our own experience. So if it works, do more of it. Right. This is such complex material we're dealing with here. Okay, so that's supplemental instruction. Uh, let me just observe other things. Um, there's also uh, the addressing of basic skills. Now, you know, you have, you know, it's mathematics. I think 70% of your students are basic skills in math. I hear it's 20% in reading and writing, but I doubt that. I think it's in more. Uh, I think, it, what, do you, what do you think? Are you shaking your head? Is it only 20% in reading and writing? Oh, I would say I, I, I totally agree with you. That it's more. What I was mumbling was, I'm not sure that those tests are testing are, are good tests of right. what the issues are. I'm not sure either. But I can't speak for your situation. In any case, another way they're addressing basic skills besides this or be using the freshman seminar for basic skills is to embed basic skills in coursework. There's a big project in the state of Washington called iBEST. Now, I'll give you, it's a website on, it's, it's a reference on your handout. In technical vocational courses, they're bringing basic skills instructors into the classroom. So some part of the curriculum are basic skills instructors helping students use basic skills and apply it to the course content right away. And clearly that's more, uh, more useful in a technical vocational where the application matters. So there's other things doing. There's some bridge programs that are really basic skills. And the goal of it is to make sure students don't enter the college so far behind everyone else they can't keep up. And that's why we invest in summer bridge. And often it's very successful but expensive. Okay, Cost. <coughs> Then, of course, there's things like learning communities and all go on. Okay, we'll come back to it. Okay, so this one. Feedback. Okay, we talked about early warning system. How many know about a one-minute paper or the work of Patricia Cross and Tom Angelo? Raise your hand. How many people have used the muddiest point of one-minute paper in their classes? Okay, folks, we have to play a game. Okay. Here's the game. I'm going to tell you how I use the one minute paper or Muddy's Point in my classes. You're going to tell me why this technique works, even though you've never used it. You get it? And this is particularly for faculty. <clears throat> okay. Get it? That's the game. I teach a class of about 
<coughs> 65 students is called the American School. It's a sort of required sort of social foundations course for future teachers. And you know, I do, I do cooperative teaching, I do problem-based learning, I do video work, we do all sorts of stuff, portfolios. But at the end of, I teach two classes a week, 15 weeks, 30 classes. Uh, about 24 of them, I use a one-minute paper technique. And this is what it is. I say to them at the end of class, I want you to take one minute before we leave and answer two questions for me. Now, it actually takes more than a minute, but if I said a three-minute paper, they're not going to do it. You, know, you, don't, <laughs> you can't be too honest with students. Don't quote, am I being, uh, am I being <laughs> I retract that statement. <laughs> you can't tell students everything. Okay. Um, I say, okay, I want to take a piece of paper. I don't want your name on it. I want you to answer two questions in two sentences. That's all I want from you. I don't want a paragraph, just two brief sentences. That's all I want. First question, uh, what is it that you found interesting about which you'd like more information? in this class. Hopefully they're saying something like, why are you wearing that suit of yours? It's so silly. Okay. Mo the important question is called the muddiest point. What is there at least one thing that you found confusing that you want clarification on? Okay. Two sentences is all I want. At the end of the class, you do that, you pass them to the end of the row, and you collect them as you walked out. No names. Now let me just tell you, uh, I have this habit, I do, and I think, I, I think all of us should do that. Uh, I always make a point of five minutes before class and five minutes after class to talk to two different students before and after, just briefly. Like, yo, V, how's it going? You know, New York. Yo, V, how's it going? And I do that because if I do that consistently, you know, it takes five minutes, ten minutes total. Uh, I end up talking to four students every class, I mean, sometimes not, but four students. That means in 30 classes, I'm talking to my students three times. Little things like that make a big difference in the classroom. It's not very, I don't say, how's your course going? I say, how's it going? What's your semester like? And I talk, to, not just the students who come to me, Professor Tinto, I, do, I talk to the students who do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know why. Students value, I can tell you how important it is for first year students to feel validated that you care enough to ask them how they're doing. Little things like that have a dramatic impact if everyone does it. Just think about that. Contact, value contact matters. Okay. In any case, after it's done, I go to my office, sit at my Macintosh. We have uh, hybrid learning, we have hybrid distance learning. That is, we have web-based assisted learning. We attach a web page to each class. We have listservs, you know, we use uh, Blackboard. Uh, but it's not Banner, okay. Um, and I sit down right away, scan these uh, papers. I don't do all 45 or 50 of them. I take half of them, maybe, 25 papers. And I randomly pick them out of the pile, those that are legible. And I read them, and I try to pick out the two or three points they're interested in that seem most common, and also the two or three points that seem to them confusing. And those that are most obvious, not all of them, but the most common. And I sit down and write a small paragraph on, on trying to give you well, have you thought of this? Have you looked at this reference? Look at this reading. It's very interesting. But importantly, I spend a paragraph on each of the muddiest points, trying to restate and clarify what was confusing to them. I send it on the listserv. I put it on the web page. But at the beginning of next class, I make a hard copy, two, one page, two-sided. I go to class, hand out the hard copy, and spend five minutes going over the muddiest points. That's what I do consistently. It's the next class, right? That technique has been shown to improve the learning of content in virtually all, virtually most classes in which it's used. It's particularly good for content. All right, it works. Now you're gonna tell me why this works. There's many reasons why this works, but you already know why this technique works to improve learning. So tell me. Come on. You know the answer. You know the reason why this works. Yes, please, stand up so everybody can hear you. Um, a lot of my students, I find, are embarrassed to ask questions out loud in front of everybody else. Good. Thank you. And therefore, this works because? They can just write the question and uh, anonymously. Right. And why does that, you, why does that work? I'm giving you feedback that you're giving them. No, wait. Why will they write down their questions now 
because they don't have their names on the paper. Now, th that means you're making a trade-off. In order to get an honest reply, you don't know who wrote the issue down. So you're trading off the ability to help individuals, the ability to help the aggregate of the class. So there's, a, there's an exchange here. But if you ask for their names, forget it. Because especially first-year students, they're worried about grades. I don't want to ask a dumb question. By the way, what I, what I typically do is um, uh, I will halfway through the semester, once we're engaged in this, I say to them, by the way, if you, if you really want to put your name down, feel free to. Then after they come to trust me, some of them will put their names down because they know I'm not about to, the grading. I'm just trying to help them learn. It's not my teaching that matters, you see. Okay, one thing. So uh, they value being asked in a way they can answer, and that changes the definition of the class. Gee, she's interested in my learning, not her teaching. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. I've never seen that before. What's another reason? Yes, sir. It's incredibly Stand up. Sorry. It's incredibly engaging. Why? Because it's, it's immediate response. It's through the internet. It's through the paper. So everyone gets a chance to see. Um, they can even see it before they get to class. Thank you. It's a feedback loop. So you're immediately responding to their needs, not your desires. I mean, I won't say that. Uh, but you see, you're giving me fear, and it's really, they get, and it's, but consistency matters. If you're not consistent, it doesn't work. Because you construct it, you're constructing a structured, intentional system. What else happens in class? Yes, madam. Stand up, please. I'm sorry, and you need exercise, everyone needs exercise. <laughs> <laughs> um, it also demonstrates your commitment to um, students' success and learning. Why? Because you're taking the time out to read these on response and, and respond to them, Bingo. and that's taking time. That's Thank extra. you. And students really care, value a faculty person is more interested in helping them learn than doing their teaching. And you're, you're demonstrating something because you're asking them in a way they can answer. Okay, good. What else? Yes, please. Uh, you know, everybody has to, come on, you, I need everybody, so everybody can hear you. They value you. What you're demonstrating is that you value their, what they say. Sure, they of course. Say. Thank you. Yes? Um, you're identifying the confusion early and right after the class instead of waiting. Bingo. The early warning system. Okay. What happens during class, do you think, now? Yes, please. Stand up. They're now asking themselves questions and engaging as they go. What do I understand? What am I interested in? You hear in? that? Don't I know? You hear that? They're paying attention. That little thing called attention, it's actually critical listening. It's sort of a, a meta-learning process. Now, it is not, not all students. Some students are still doing this. <laughs> you know? But uh, it should, we know that on average, more students are starting to ask them, if you're consistent now, they know these questions are coming. They say, do I know it? Do I not know it? And then they have to write it down. And writing down helps them crystallize. All that works, so, folks. I, I mean, it, it is deceptively simple, but it's a structure that you construct in a classroom that, rec that leads people to start thinking about their learning. It allows you to feedback consistently. You try it. It isn't, it isn't a lot of work. It's consistency that matters. Now, what I'll do is halfway through the semester, I'll also, also say to students, OK, before you turn them in, turn to your neighbors and share your one minute papers. Bingo! Hey, some people know this already. Well, they're all confused because I'm confusing. What happens to your teaching, do you think, as a faculty person? What do you think happens to you as a faculty person when you start getting these feedback loops constructed? Yes, please. You definitely have to, to realize your clarifying points. Like, where you need clarification, where you need to break things down more. You're getting feedback about your own ability to help them learn. And that's the shared feedback we need. It isn't just them, it's us. No, it's not me. I'm perfect. It's my colleagues that have this problem here. <laughs> All right, I should tell you a quick story. Uh, you know, see, how should I should. You know, we in higher education are a strange breed of faculty. I'll talk to my faculty colleagues. I have my PhD from the University of Chicago. Or I, I like to think one of the best graduate schools in the country. Of course, I went there, right? <laughs> what did I learn in my PhD about pedagogical methods, sir? What did I learn about curriculum revision and curriculum, sir? What did I learn about assessment of student learning? Zero. Sure. What did I learn about learning style, student development theory? Zero. Sure. What qualifies me to teach? I have a PhD, man. <laughs> oh, damn. 
<laughs> no, folks, it's a serious issue. We as a faculty have never been trained to help our students learn. And it's not our fault. It's, it, it's this bureaucratic medieval system from which we spring that says you need a PhD to teach even if you're never trained to teach. What? Yes, sir. Do you mind if I add something to that? I can't stand up. Uh, I got my PhD from Big Research University, Big Public Research where? University. And there was like some where, where, which one? Texas A&M. Texas A&M. And um, they had something like the Center for Teaching Excellence. And I went there as a graduate student. And they told me that faculty members who worked with them asked them not to share that information with anyone because it was frowned upon that they really spent time on you know, improving their teaching rather than doing research. Oh. <laughs> and now I'm picking on my own school. But I suspect something like that goes on in many places. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, we're all in the same boat, folks. Um, that has to change. Because for most students, the time they spend on the campus is the classroom. And therefore, we as faculty must be provided those skills and tools to help construct learning environments that help them learn. But we've never been given those tools. It's not us. I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm not trying to blame the victim here, but it's a, the it's a truth. So part of the things we're going to talk about next is the pedagogical support you need as a faculty member to th learn these things, to do it in your classroom within reason. It's, it's the way it works. Again, it's not me, it's my colleagues. Okay? <laughs> so the point is, uh, there's a lot of this stuff. One minute papers is a clever technique. Now, I'll tell you quickly a story. Right? We're going to break in a bit, a bit to have more conversation. My wife, Patricia, is a trained high school teacher. She was a gifted high school teacher. And she decided to go back and get a doctorate in education and mathematics. And now she runs, she has a PhD, she runs a big teaching training program at Syracuse. She has big NSF grants, trying to redo the curriculum of math teaching in elementary school in the whole city of Syracuse. She knows teaching, right? She really knows this stuff. So about, about oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I first learned about these assessment techniques. Now, we have in our, we live right by the university in a big old sort of a mission style house. It's a lovely house. But we have a, it's a big house. I mean, it's relatively big uh, by California standards. Uh, and we have four bedrooms upstairs, one of which we converted to a study for us, Pat and I. Uh, our daughter's rooms still are their daughter's rooms, even though they haven't lived there in years. It's what happens. Okay. <laughs> so we have this big room. One side of the room, my wife has her desk with her Macintosh. I have my desk with my Macintosh. And we have bookcases between us, not to give us a little privacy and to put our books. And the first time I was doing this, I came home from class and I said, I was going through these papers and I said, geez, these kids are not paying attention. Oh my gosh, look at this. Pat didn't say anything to me. I did it the next week and I go a little like, more like a New York. I said, shucks. I said, shucks. Shucks. These kids are not paying attention. <coughs> then my wife, Pat, did this to me. Now, men, you pay attention because you've seen this before. She looks around the, the desk, uh, the bookcase, and she uses my formal name. Now, look, when your partner uses your formal name, <laughs> and then she does something women do to men all the time, she speaks slower. <laughs> <laughs> See how she laughs? This, this strikes truth. So she goes, Vincent, uh, yeah, I'm on alert, yes, dear? Do you use a lesson plan? Huh? And she sees my look and she goes, slower, Vincent, do you, my point is I had no idea. So she's t telling me about, you know, what lecturing is about, how do you do events, organize the lesson plans, you have to know where you're going to get there. I had no idea. So I was getting feedback. And it's very important, folks. We need as faculty that support that allows us, especially when we begin our career as faculty, especially for the new faculty who join us, to not be placed in the situation we're being placed in now. Oh, by the way, I have two daughters. Katie's a public defender in Los Angeles. Gabby is a classical voice major in a choir that's doing a recording as we speak. And both of them, when about five or six, they wanted to make a point to me. I noticed both of them started speaking slower. <laughs> I said, what? This nature, nurture, what is this, genetic? Oh, forget it. My point is, try it, folks. Try that technique. How many people use it in their classroom? Who's used this technique in their classroom? Well, folks, try it. The, the, there's a book I cite in my handout. It's called, from t uh, it's a book by uh, uh, Angelo and Cross. Everyone should have access to that book. It's a lovely written book. Each chapter is an example of assessment technique. 
of one of which is only this, this portfolio work, the whole set of stuff. It is a wonderful book you should all have access to, especially in the first year classrooms. Especially, of course, that's where success really has consequence later on, or the lack thereof. Okay. Okay. Let's finish up. But in the classroom, students need to be engaged. So part of the, the struggle we have is we've never been trained to use these pedagogies, cooperative teaching, problem-based learning, or in some cases, service learning. How many people here are trained in cooperative teaching? Nursing, right. How many people use problem-based learning? Folks, this is again a thing that you must ask of your institution and your faculty to support you. These techniques, since so much of time of students are spent in the classroom, if you don't engage them there, where will you engage them? So in institutions are using you know, cooperative teaching, they're using problem-based learning, whole set of uh, you know, media construction. Now, let me be clear. Cooperative teaching is not group work. You know what I mean. We're all been students once. I still remember, I think. I was sharing with Ed, I still have my punch cards. Ed and I keep our punch cards. We're sort of perverse, right, Ed? We keep our punch cards. Um, when a faculty member says to us as students, I want for you to form together a group and do a paper together, and that's all he or she says, what happens, folks? One person does the work, two maybe, and two or three freeload. That's called crappy teaching. Why? Because some people figure out you can get a good grade with doing little work. No one rises to low expectations. Cooperative group work is not that. And don't confuse the two. It's a highly structured form of independent work where students have to work in cooperative groups where a, a task or problem can't be done without each person doing their part. And you as a faculty, a faculty member have to moderate that group to make sure individuals do their part as well as the group together does their part. And that means you change your stance vis-a-vis -vis assessment of student performance. You give to the group some ability to assess themselves. And you monitor both individual parts of the project and the project writ whole. And when you assess a grade, you at least combine two parts. It's a project grade and you're part of the project. So you have a reinforcement system. How many people do that in their classrooms? Anybody use anything like that in their classrooms? Can you stand up and tell us what you do? Tell your colleagues what you do. And what do you teach? I used to teach. When I used to teach um, research methods in psychology, they had very large... Tell your colleagues. Pardon? Tell your colleagues what you do. Um, I have students edit, do peer editing for their crosswork because the writing a research paper in high style is very, very complicated. And so they get a scaffolded set of instructions of how to interview the other student to ask them and inquire. Um, why did you write it this way? I don't understand what this means. They have to work together and everybody's grade, there's a group grade, okay. but every student also gets an individual grade. Um, the groups would have to submit a job description of what everybody agreed to as being Good. responsibilities. You know this. And then they go Good. <laughs> you and some other faculty members should form a group and being supported by the university to give a workshop for your own faculty, especially the new faculty who come to you. You should. Because you don't need outside people to tell you to do this. You know it. Share what you know with other people because this works. Now, it's work. But we spend time working in our classes anyway. Why don't we just change what we do? I mean, it's, it's more complex than that, of course. Problem-based learning has the same thing. It's cooperative group work. But the task of the group is to solve a problem that frames the spine of a course, which is typical of nursing, for example. So example, I teach a research course as well. But I start the first class, it's often the first class of my program uh, for the master's degree students uh, in student affairs. I say to them, uh, good evening. We teach a lot of evening classes. Welcome to Syracuse University. This is your first course of this program. I want to tell you when we start, I don't have a final exam. Oh, I love this class. <laughs> oh, God, what a great guy. I'm going to love it here. Ah, uh, but we have a final exercise. <gasps> what? What? Final exercise. What I do is I set up the following scenario. You're going to form consulting teams of five. So you're going to be maybe six, six groups in the class. You're going to be responding to requests for proposal from a university who wants you to design a research study. 
to answer certain problems. Uh, the whole class is made geared around giving you the skills and knowledge you need to make a competitive bid. And therefore, that problem, I know what the problem requires. Therefore, I construct all my teaching and what I ask them to learn. So they, over time, develop the skills to solve the problem. 60% of their grade, 60, 65, 70% of their grade is a problem solution. It matters. And it's in cooperative groups, so I do all that stuff. Uh, I tell them at the last class they make presentations. They have to come in front of the class and make a verbal presentation with PowerPoint, video. They do all this. They get dressed up. Uh, and I tell them, uh, your presentation doesn't affect your grade. The product does. But I will award the contract and in the class. And I award an $80 coupon for lunch at a high-end French restaurant in Syracuse. The competition for that <laughs> gift, the kids go wild. So I try to blend cooperation and competition. But it's all geared about them having to apply, apply what they're learning to a concrete problem. N nursing knows this. And the more closely you can take what they're trying to learn and contextualize it to a real problem, the more students will find it interesting. Especially the problem seems relevant to them. Okay, that's problem-based learning. Okay, there's a lot here, folks. And lastly, and I'll stop, well, a couple things I'll stop. You know about learning communities? <coughs> learning communities are also becoming a way of doing the same thing in a multiple curriculum context. So you take the same things we've been talking about and make it apply to several courses in which students co-register. So in some way, learning communities are becoming a, a mini first year experience that combines pedagogy, assessment, that links students in various courses. For example, it could be two courses where the writing instructor is working with the sociology instructor, she's writing on sociology, linked support. It could be the same thing for mathematics and engineering, or it could be more than one course. It could be a U.S. history course, English course, and some students, because they, they need to have skills, they take a freshman seminar that's connected to the curriculum, not separated from it. So the seminar works best when it's connected to the leads of students to apply what they're learning here to here. The same thing, what's called cluster courses. Let me just point out to you, I know you're going through a general curriculum revision. Let me give you an example. Not this, this particular example, but this, this model is being used by a community college in Los Angeles whose name uh, eludes me for a moment. Uh, the course is designed for, there are many students who are immigrant students, Latino, Mexicanos. Uh, they are the immigrants themselves, some illegal, or the parents immigrants. Uh, their course involves a course in history, sociology and writing, basic writing. The learning community is organized on a theme, and the theme is captured by the title, Whose Country Is It Anyway? And it's a historical sociological analysis of the role of immigration in the formation of American culture. And the students write on that, so that these courses all look at immigration as a theme that connects and integrates the curriculum. And in this case, they have to use part of their autobiography as the text. Well, I can't tell you how validating that must be. Can you imagine? I, I can only imagine if I had the chance in, in college to use my father's and mother's history and validate that it really matters. Okay, in any case, the point of learning community then is not only to integrate support, provide a coherent, integrated curricular experience where student learning is not discrete, this subject versus that subject versus this subject. <coughs> it's right about a coherent, integrated, general curriculum experience that is not simply a menu of courses. It becomes a mini college. And that's why a lot of schools are starting to rethink not only the gateway courses, but thinking the first year experience itself as a mini college within William Patterson University. And using learning communities with pedagogies of engagement and assessment as the core of the new first year college in a micro way. And let me just observe. You are in a very competitive environment. You have a lot of schools that compete with you. 
Think what it would mean to have a distinctive first year experience. How would it attract students who want to come here as their first choice? Because part of successful students are students who want to be here to be, who want to come here to be successful. And how do you get them to want to come here? Not just the fancy brochures you publish. So there's a linking between what you're doing to build success, how you market it and what you do, and having students who are more likely to be successful in coming. So when someone says to me, if the admission office only gave me good students, I wouldn't have a problem, I say to you, if you only develop innovative programs that attract those good students, you wouldn't have less of a problem. Right. So there's a range of things, folks, uh, many things. They all require collaboration between various members of the campus. It isn't just faculty. It's faculty with residential life. It's faculty with student affairs. It's faculty with learning centers. A whole set of stuff. It is a shared responsibility. Now, what you end up doing is for you to decide. But these are the things that you should think about, the very strategies that are being used now. Because they all try to answer the same question. How do we construct these environments, especially starting with the classroom? OK. Have I bored you enough? Yeah. Well, okay, we're not finished yet. Now we're doing a one-minute paper. <laughs> I want you at least here. You don't have to write it down. Uh, what is the one thing I found interesting? Say something, please, uh, that I would like to ask about. For yourself, what is the money's point for me? What is the one thing I'm unclear about? I want you to think about that and form, without hurting your backs now, Form groups of two or three. I mean, I don't know if you can turn around. Do the best you can. And quickly, share your one-minute paper with your people whom you're talking with. So it's going to take you a minute at most. Quickly go around the room. And see if you can coalesce on at least one comment or question you'd like to pose to all of us so we can answer together in a shared way your questions or comments. Okay? Let's do that. So it's been long. I apologize. We're not going to go more than another 10 minutes at most. I, I, Nina asked me to remind us all that all the information I sent, I sent articles, uh, you have this handouts, they'll all be placed on a web page so you can all get access. I sent about 15 articles and papers uh, so you can get access to stuff. And all of them relate to these concrete examples uh, that we talked about as well as the web page information and the references I gave you in the handout. So there's more information around folks. So who wants to start with a comment or a question? Sir, can you stand up? Your name? Francis Cozia. Francisco Diaz. Francisco. <laughs> hey, by the way, my name Tinto is actually Spanish. It's not Italian. Vino Tinto. You know what that means, right? Yeah, yeah I'm not a one. <laughs> and I'm not really I Spanish, but okay. So, Francisco. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. I guess a comment more than anything. One of the things that I. I you kept speaking about the importance of the integration or the working with other areas, faculty and staff, and, and you gave some examples of, of the support systems. Um, but I have wanted a little bit more of that. So when you talk about like future presentations, because you asked the audience before how many were faculty, and some people raised their hand. Obviously, the balance are not necessarily teaching on a regular basis. Some of us do adjunct. Yeah. And I oh. think we didn't hear enough of, you know, all, you mentioned student life, you mentioned the other areas. But not how we can integrate better um, and work together as partners. Who's we, we do that now. We, we meaning student affairs folks okay. and, and academic okay. affairs folks. We do that now, but I would like to have heard more of that in the presentation. Good. Next question. No, let me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Learning communities by the very structure require collaboration. In the same way, uh, you know, supplemental structure requires some form of collaboration. Typically, in a learning community, especially first-year students, this could be a freshman seminar. So it's a, a typically student affairs person. She or he has to work with other faculty. I know some faculty teach and some don't. But often, learning communities are a structured form that require collaboration. See, I don't, collaboration doesn't arise because of good intentions. It arises because you have programs that require collaboration. So I said, if you want to build collaboration, construct programs that require that. People learn to collaborate because they have to work together, not because we tell them to. So this is an example. If you're teaching a freshman seminar, that person should be talking to the other faculty who teach all the other courses in which those students are registered. So it often helps to have people registered for a freshman seminar 
whose courses are the same, even though they may not be linked. So you talk to other faculty members, how could I do, what I can do in my freshman seminar could help your students in your classes. Those are various forms of, of collaboration. Uh, and I say let's start with that because that affects the classroom experience where it matters. Okay, another question. Yes, please. Let me, is everyone can hear, can you stand up so everyone can hear the question? I'm sorry. Um, when we have adjunct faculty that are staff, that's, that's fine because we're all on the same page most of the time. But when we have a lot of adjunct faculty, which I believe is about 60% of the schools, um, yeah. how do you get everyone on, pay, on, on the same track um, in terms of knowing what we're doing, know the direction we're going because we're all in so many different places? Uh, I wish I had an answer for you. Ever heard that question? Uh, you know, there's a consequence for having large adjunct faculty. It's not their fault. It's that often they have other jobs, right? They may be working in industry. They may be teaching other places. And there's only so much you can expect. So uh, it is unavoidably the case, I would think, that if, you want, if you're going to start with the first year program, which I say that's where you start, giving you the resources, uh, much of that work should be carried out by full-time faculty. Now, it's easy to say not... It's one thing to say, nothing to do. But if you do have adjuncts, how do you construct a setting for them to be engaged? The conditions that relate to student success relate to faculty success. Same set of conditions. I mean, it's the same thing. So what support do they need? What feedback do they need? What ways do you engage adjunct faculty so they're not isolated, uh, independent of everybody else? In some ways, faculty are more, independ more isolated from each other than students are. That's a problem. Especially for adjunct faculty, they don't have offices, they don't come in, they don't talk to the faculty, there's no shared developmental process for them. Why aren't adjunct faculty part of your first year faculty development program? Are they? I don't know. Now, not all of them can do that, but you ask the same questions. <coughs> what are the conditions that promote their success that also are related to student success? But it's a hard problem. I mean, I, I don't mean to diminish the problem. That's why a lot of first-year programs, especially the structured learning communities, work with full-time faculty. And that means you have some choices. Yes, please, back yes. there. Um, we did start a, a program uh, or doing an orientation for all faculty, new faculty. I know you do. Whether they're not, whether they're adjuncts or full-time. Right. But also the, some of the programs that, that it meets once a month. Uh, in some of the uh, programs, like in English, they do have ongoing mentors. Right. And, and it's uh, people who, who want to come, come. Right. <laughs> Next question. Uh, oh, see, there are incentives. No, I understand. So that they no. Do come. Uh, this is a project that I'm pursuing with the Gates Foundation. There are a number of colleges, uh, mostly community, I'm looking at community colleges in particular, because that's where teaching really is really critical. Well, it's critical every place. A couple of community colleges in the nation have started required first year faculty learning communities where faculty in exchange for one course reduction in their contract meet once a week with all new faculty a year long process and they actually learn about cooperative teaching. They learn about assessment techniques, learn about lecturing techniques, they learn about technology. So they end up the first year before they get overwhelmed with some modicum of skills that we have, and it's required, it's not a question of choice. And uh, the faculty I've talked to about this, they love it. And many of the faculty, even after the first year, they retain relationships with the faculty they've met in the first year, like students do in the faculty or student community. So it's, it's taking the same principles, but saying how do we do it and not leave it to chance. But it's, it's a matter of investment, it, but that's what's happening. At some point, we're gonna have to do it anyway. Yes, madam, you had your hand up. I just want to... Um, Please. We did our... We did the companion... First of all, I'm the director of institutional research and assessments, which they know about. Um, you look too nice to be a researcher. I mean, you look... <laughs> but to reinforce um, your participation faculty for doing the first year... for the, doing the FESI survey, one of the things oh, the we, fancy did, too? We, we did the companion <laughs> survey, but it makes, and all, to, to reinforce also your point that we need to use assessment data when yeah. we make statements, one of the things we did was look at 
we, we had a special report done that looked at the difference between full-time faculty and part-time faculty. And while there are differences in their perceptions of what goes on in the classroom, I guess to me what was more striking was the similarities. So yeah. to okay, me, good. I think your last statement that all faculty need this kind of training is the more important statement and not this part-time, full-time distinction. So anybody who ends with a compliment is where I should stop. <laughs> no, but let me just observe, uh, use Nessie. Uh, my problem with Nessie is not Nessie, it's his administration. Because they do a random sample and often response rates are low, 25%, 30% at most. Do you know what your response rates were for Nessie? Our response rates for Nessie are low, right. but we have three, around 20%. Yeah, so you get information, uh, at eight out of every 10 students are not answering Nessie, so the question is, what do you learn? Uh, I prefer, the real problem I see with Nessie, I mean, the problem, that's, uh, that's not a fair statement, is because it's designed to get a representative portrait of the campus, and the response rates are low, it doesn't give you the detail within the campus about what works well and what doesn't. So I'd prefer to have you use it, and you probably do already, like SESI does it, the community college version. You administer it in specific classrooms. So you can find out what are we doing now that it has engaged students that we can learn from. Nessie doesn't give you that. It gives you an aggregate so you can compare yourself to another institution across the street or someplace. And yet it's the internal information about what works and doesn't that we need for ourselves. So let me just end with a point. We, have, we need to get more evidence of what's working, what's not. And again, the very simple conclusion, if it's working, do more of it. But how do you know what's working and not is the question. Finally, I, I do have to stop. <coughs> I mean, you want to make a quick observation? Yes, please, madam. You're, you. Yes, I did. Um, I just wanted to point out part of student success also involves a financial component. Oh, yeah. And you had it on your slide. I didn't talk. talk I mean, there's so much to talk about. Yeah, right, yeah. Right, but I, I would be more interested in you know, students being able to pay their bill. Oh, agreed. To, you know. And you have so many Pell eligible students, and sometimes their grants don't come through. Can they buy books? <coughs> Do you help them buy books? Okay. Let me just conclude. I, I, there's so much. Email me, okay? <coughs> um, finally, student success does not arise by chance, folks. It's not sufficient to care about it. That's only a minimum condition. It's to translate your commitment and caring to a structured, intentional, proactive program that does not leave it to chance. It's too important. If we know something works, do more of it and eventually require it of students, within reason. It's our obligation to do that. So please, as you take these initiatives, figure out how do you go from the things we talked about, and it's already long, and translate it to a structure that is intentional, that provides a content which students are clear about what's required of them. And even though they may complain, some <coughs> do. It's in their interest that they have a coherent structure, especially first-generation college students who simply don't have that structure upon which to draw. And if I could be of help, email me, folks. Give me a call. Thank you very much. Thank you.